Hey, what's good, everybody? Welcome to The Doe Show. Happy, happy Wednesday, the Wednesday after midterm elections. Have you seen the stock market today? Very interesting. Well, we are financial advisors at Jazz Wealth here. I uh, hope you'll check us out. Give us a shot. We are SEC Fiduciary Financial Advisors. That basically means we operate in your best interest, and the SEC is going to make sure we do that for you. Uh, we don't play any games. A lot of people uh, expect to see some kind of game or some sort of trick, and there's just nothing there. The reason why is because if we play games, you would find those comments on all of our videos and likely on reviews as well. So no games here. We invest for you for retirement. Uh, we use our own funds to do that. And this show is actually a way that we help you learn more. Our best customers are engaged. They understand. They're willing to learn. They, they don't need to be there all the time. We don't have to talk every day, of course, but they want to learn. And that's the best sort of type of customer in any business that you can have. And one day, the bigger companies are going to figure out, hey, teach people how it all works and just don't hold back and they'll make for better customers. So until that happens, I'm here every day, twice a day, teaching you everything I know that comes into this ugly little head of mine. So uh, today we're working with the beginners. I'm talking to my beginners out there that go, how much risk do I take in my account relative to my goal? What does it all mean? What options do I have as far as taking risk, you know, investments that I can use for that? What, what does this all mean? How do we put it together in a simplified way? I'm gonna start simple, I'm gonna go real geeky on you today, and even maybe show you a slide or two if I remembered to put them up on the old deal there. Show you how we do it here at Jazz, actually specifically how we do it for the different portfolios that we manage. So uh, in the meantime, if you'll do me a favor, if you're watching this live, post uh, a type of investment, a real estate investment trust, a blue chip stock, something like that. You post it for me. I want to plot it on this for you here and really build as we go. I'll try to keep it short, I promise. Okay, risk to reward. If you don't know what risk to reward means, you're taking some level of risk in expectation of some reward. However, in the real world, we don't measure that, right? The only way that I can think that people measure it is by a lottery ticket, right? You buy the dollar scratch off ticket and you get a free ticket. You go, well, that was easy. You get another one. You scratch it off, you win a dollar. You go, oh wow, look at me, I'm winning. You get another one, you scratch it off, maybe you win two. And you go, well, this is sweet, look, I'm ahead. And you keep going. You eventually lose, but you measure, I took such a very little risk and I keep winning, so I keep seeing a little reward. Maybe a slot machine's another good example. You win a little, win a little, win a little, you're done, you lost, right? Um, if you buy a $2, uh, is it Powerball, uh, the other one? What? I can't think of the other one. So let's say it's two bucks to buy one of those tickets and you have the potential to win $500 million. You know that you're most likely not gonna win that thing, right? So you're measuring, it's $2 I'm never gonna see again for the fun to tell my friends that I got one number right. Okay, you take that risk. In anything else in life, people just don't care, right? What's the risk of going to an auto dealer versus going and haggling with someone privately for a used car? What's the risk of using like an online site versus uh, just going to a dealership and buying a car? We don't think about it. We just go for ease of use. And so even with your investments, everybody goes, what's the easiest thing I can do so I can put this behind me and not have to look at it again? Uh, one of the reasons we offer automated deposits, everybody does it. It's because it's easy to set it up and let people go. Now here at Jazz, we're a little different because I want you to know how much you're putting in. I don't care if you put in $50 every week, so long as that meets your goal. If your goal is to only, uh, you only need to put in $44 a week, then I want you to put in $44 a week, right? So I don't just let you blindly do things. I also don't let you blindly go through your investments and assume that you're taking enough risk for the reward. You ever see one of those uh, videos where the, the, there's a table and then there's the kitchen counter? and the cat's on the table and he's looking over at the kitchen counter at some food and he knows there's a big gap there that he's got to jump and he like moves his legs. He's like, I think I can do this. You know, you can see it in his face. The cat makes the jump to go for the kitchen, hits the corner and flops over and it's funny to watch, right? Or a dog doing the same thing. They're measuring risk to reward for survival, right? It's not because they're just trying to rip you off and take your food, it's survival in their heads. So when it comes to retirement investing, I want you guys to think of what's the least amount of risk that I can take to generate the reward or the return that I need to generate, right? So look, the lottery ticket, the cat falling off the counter, the slot machines, buying a car at a dealership, these are all really not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. 
But I come on here and I do this show because you know, one of the things I point out is, look, if you get to be 65 years old and you didn't have the right investments for a 10 year period of your life, you're going to be very disappointed and we can't go back. It's too late. You're going to be one of those people that goes, well, I'm 65. I was hoping to retire. I'm going to have to work till 72. And then all of a sudden you start feeling bad. So with your investments, stay with me, take five more minutes with me or 10 minutes and let's go through the risk to reward. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is investing is not linear. I mentioned this a little bit yesterday, and this is kind of what sparked the idea here, although this was uh, sort of pre-planned. You have risk versus reward, and I tried to draw that very nice and clean. Not bad. Okay, so you are taking a set amount of risk. The greater the amount of risk, really the greater the amount of reward you should get, right? Well, in anything else, you may be able to say, yes, take more risk, get more returns, and it would be a straight line. It would be perfect. He who wants to take the most risk generates the greatest reward. However, I've said this before, the stock market has been boiled down to a bunch of stats. No longer is there any emotion, and, and I mentioned this yesterday about the trading companies that are out there. They're all statistics based. That's it, right? The kid that, uh, a friend of my brother's, no, my a friend's brother is what I was trying to say, uh, works for a company that I mentioned yesterday and all they do is stats, right? Everything's based on stats. And one of the things that everybody's boiled down is it's not linear. There is not an infinite amount of risk you can take to generate an infinite amount of return. So it's actually more like this, right? At some point, the risk you take is not worth the return that you get. And people realize that. It's called the efficient frontier and we're going to go through it, of course. Uh, now this came out like in the 50s or something like that, but it's really become understood more nowadays with the advent of computers. And I'm going to show you in a minute how we actually take one of our portfolios and before we make any adjustments, we're actually able to find the most efficient way to adjust it so that you're taking as little risk as possible for the said goal or the return that we have in mind. Okay, so I asked you a minute ago to mention some different types of investments, okay? And so uh, you guys got a lot of stocks in there. Okay, here's what I was kind of thinking. Um, what is the most conservative investment one can have? Meaning as little risk as you can take, unfortunately, you're going to get the, the smallest amount of return. So if you think about what's out there, it's certainly not pot stocks, right? You're not, that's not little risk for a little return. That's big risk, big return. What is it that we can do um, as far as, you know, next to no risk, but with just a little bit of return. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this the return. So I'll just put percentage return here. And this is going to be the risk that you're taking in. And now when we're talking about the efficient frontier, it's actually risk in terms of standard deviations, uh, standard deviation of the volatility of what you're taking. Let's put that aside for a second. It's the risk you're taking. So no need to go into college uh, statistics here. Okay. So here's what we've got. Let's say uh, this is where your returns start, right here. And then the more risk you're willing to take, potentially the more you'll have in returns, okay? So just to kind of break it down there, real simple. The least amount of risk we can take for the smallest amount of return would be a uh, bond, right? So I'm gonna go like this. We're gonna say that this is a bond or a bill or a note, however you wanna look at it, okay? Uh, <laughs> good. Okay, so um, look, if you're not familiar with bonds, there's a number of different ways to do it. Um, it starts with the shortest term, T-bills, which you'll usually see, treasury bills, people just say T-bills. Those are the shortest, <coughs> excuse me, those are the shortest term um, notes that your bonds that you can get. Uh, they call them T-bills, they range from four weeks to one year. There is essentially no risk. It's backed by the US government, However, since it's backed by the government, you're going to get paid back just a tiny amount. Next to no risk for a very tiny return. It goes up from there uh, as you go. So you could have T-bills, uh, notes would be the next thing. Maybe you've seen it on TV or something. Those are less than 10 years and then anything over that uh, is going to be called bonds, right? The 30-year bond, usually something that you see. Uh, we talk about it on the closing beat every now and then. Okay, so those are bonds. You can also say uh, something like money markets, and I won't write them all out, you know, just so we don't have this whole thing going on here. Money markets fall into the same category where they would land. This would be a money market account. Money market accounts, by the way, are just a mix of CDs and bonds. So a money market, 
they've just essentially done the work for you in terms of saying, um, we'll go ladder out the CDs, we'll ladder out the notes and the bills and the bonds, and we'll just gen give you some of that return. So um, that's a money market fund, all right? <laughs> so for example, now, oh, so that was just giving an example. Now bonds and money market funds, who is that suitable for, right? So we're talking about investing with the right investments relative to the risk. Who are these investments suitable for? They're not suitable for you if you're younger, right? They're suitable for the short-term investor, meaning the person that's, besides bonds, right? So they're suitable for the person that says, um, I've got two years, three years, four years, until I need all that money back. I'm not really willing to take any risk. That's someone that's very close to retirement or very close to their goal, right? Uh, buying the house, the car, getting married, whatever it is your goal is. That's what's suitable there. If you call me up, and you say, uh, getting married in three years, what should I invest in? The answer is not invest. <laughs> so I'm gonna say, mm, go for your high interest savings account, your money markets, whatever, short term. It's not great, but there's no risk there, okay? So that's who that's suitable for. If you have an IRA, a Roth IRA, whatever, at a bank, I need you to look at it, right? If you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and you've got something at one of those banks, I need you to look at it because chances are you've got some really conservative investments in there, and that's horrible because you got to take the risk while you're younger, okay? So, um, speaking of bonds, what about corporate bonds? Those would go here, right? You know what a corporate bond is? So, a corporate bond would be uh, like Tesla, great example. Tesla raises money in the form of debt from the general public, but they don't use shares. Shares are equity, bonds are debt. And so Tesla goes out there and says, we need more money to fund our operations, and they issue debt. The public can participate in that debt. It's more risk, so they have to pay more, right? Because Tesla could you know, disappear one day, something bad could happen, and it would, you don't have the backing of the US government. So here, backing of the US government, corporate bonds that are issued all the time, uh, there's technically risk there. They do return a little bit more, and so uh, that would be those. REITs, what about REITs or real estate? Can we use a different color? So let's use real estate or REITs. That's gonna fall right about here. Now stick with me, because I'm, I'm not just like drawing bubbles on a, on a chart here or whatever. Um, if we look at uh, large cap stocks, or so let's say small cap. Here's your small cap stocks. Right? They're gonna be up here in the mix, of course, more risk, more return. Over here is gonna be emerging markets, right? Lots of risk, but bigger potential returns, right? Over, you're also gonna have your blue chip stocks in here. I'm just trying to think one step ahead of you guys, so help, hang in there. Blue chip. What else do you got? Anybody else? Uh, commodities, right? Is that, do, does somebody post that one on there? Commodities, all right, we'll put it right here. This could be, uh, we'll just call it commodities as a whole, right? I'm not gonna pick on like individual gold and, and things like that. You've got your uh, mutual funds, right? So mutual funds are an asset class, things that you can look at here. Uh, and it maybe let's just say it's a growth fund. So I'm gonna put it right here. This would be a growth mutual fund. What else you got? Growth Mutual Fund, I'll put it right there. I'm just trying to not get things in the way here. Uh, dividend stocks, yeah, perfect. So you've got your dividend stocks. Little less return, right? We're gonna do a video on this as well. Oops. So dividend stocks, what you have is, um, of course you have a little bit less risk because you're getting that dividend return, but you're gonna get a little bit smaller of a reward compared to your growth stocks, your emerging uh, markets, small cap, large cap, things like that. Yeah, large cap can go up in there. Um, large cap would actually fall sort of like right in here if I can do this, large cap. Okay, and so you see how obviously the younger you are, here's the investments you wanna start focusing on. I'm not gonna go, I was gonna do the whole mutual fund thing and ETFs and everything. They're basically all in this category, okay? Um, utilities, perfect. So utilities are actually quite efficient. Right, and I would, uh, right? So they're individual stocks, you're taking a little bit more risk relative to corporate bonds. They do return a little bit more again because of the dividends. Dividend stocks can beat utility stocks. Typically they do because a lot of dividend stocks are still in a 
tiny bit of the growth phase, you know, a little, little bit of the growth phase, okay? So as far as investments that you can um, choose, oh, you wanna know where Bitcoin falls? Check this out. Here's your crypto. Good one. Good. You starting to see why I drew it down there? So that's about where crypto falls <laughs> as far as is the data, as far back as we can go. Um, but great, so you guys got that stuff in there. Now, here's what I wanna do. We just mentioned a minute ago that there is not an infinite amount of risk relative to the return that you can take. At some point, it becomes that you're taking more risk for a tiny, uh, a smaller generated return. And so here's actually how the whole thing goes. Risk versus the ultimate return that you're taking, uh, that you're getting, sorry. So look what happens here. You've got real estate. Real estate, you're taking a decent amount of risk, right, relative to the return. But you could come over here and go, look, this doesn't fall on my line. For real estate or REITs, I'm taking too much risk for the generated return. I could come all the way over here, get closer to bond ETFs, laddered bond ETFs. I really should be looking at these products for the same projected return, but taking a lot less risk. Does that help me out? Tell me if that makes sense, by the way. Okay. Tell me if that makes sense. Now, if we look at dividend stocks, dividend stocks are not technically as efficient as they could be relative to utilities. You see what happens? We could just go do you some utility mix, maybe a few dividend stocks, but a mix of utility stocks and be more efficient with the money that we're using for the said goal. Now, this doesn't mean you go, eh, I'm about this risky, I'll pick from these investments. No, it means what's your goal? You're building a portfolio. The Efficient Frontier is built based off of a portfolio, so it's never gonna be one individual stock. You're gonna build a portfolio of dividend stocks and then go, it's not as efficient as it could be, right? I could be doing something else. Maybe by mixing in some utilities, a few corporate bonds, and some real estate investment trusts, now I can get to this most efficient expected return out of this, but not be taking excess risk. Look at crypto right? If you are in Bitcoin, you are taking an obscene amount of risk for something that you are only going to see as expected return. Again, based on what data we have on that, this could change. Maybe it does take over the world. That's the risk you're taking is that the return is going to be much greater. You know what we're, you know, like that's high risk, low odds. You can take the shot if you want to, but that's where it's at. Mutual funds are horrible at being efficient because and it's not that they're bad, it's that mutual funds have a different goal. So their goal is not to be as efficient as possible. Their goal is to cycle out the positions that they need to, to stay on their objective. And if you look up any mutual fund, it'll tell you what their objective is. Their objective is not to have the most efficient vehicle possible for an investor. And that's largely because they, they I hate to say it this way, but the lower cost funds, they're just not gonna do that work. It doesn't make sense. They're offering you a product at such a low cost they're just not gonna do it. Some of them that are more costly at least have it in their objective that efficiency is key, low turnover, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but in the, at the end of the day, there are other investments with less risk that will generate equal or similar returns. And so this is a crude, horrible way to draw this out, but it's visual, okay? So for me, it's Maybe this doesn't make sense to you, but you can see how if you're choosing certain investments, you might want to look and see if you can blend other stuff in there so that you're more efficient with the money. All right, now the cool part. Let me show you what we got here. Did I put it up? Help me out, I put it up. Yeah, I did it. Okay, here is an actual portfolio here at Jazz. It's our conservative portfolio. Um, and what we do is we have a target in mind. So. I can't like touch it, but if you look at where the biggest density of the red dots are, it's the easiest way I can explain it, that is our target return. So we position our conservative portfolio, this one in particular, to really not be super aggressive. This would be designed for someone who's more conservative or for someone who is closer to retirement and does not need to participate directly with the market. So before you leave a comment, oh, that fund doesn't beat the market, it's not supposed to. It's not supposed to come anywhere near it. That's the goal. So our goal is that. 
Now, all the red dots that you see are all the potential adjustments we could make to that mix of funds. And so what happens is before we do anything, we don't just randomly say, how about 3.48% in this one? Give me a little bit of Verizon. Give me a little bit of a utility stock. We don't just like guess, right? We actually go and say, here's what we want. This is our return. Now, how do we adjust in the most efficient way possible? See the red dots that are all the way over here? That means that an adjustment that we were considering would increase the risk, but we wouldn't see much more return. Uh, relative to our goal. We would see more of a return, but our goal is not to be way up there in returns for this fund. So if you have a conservative approach, then you want to know how closely can you adjust to get to the desired return of the portfolio. And so every time we go to make an adjustment, actually this happens every day, we look at this and go, is our current allocation deviating from what the most efficient way to invest is for that goal is? And sometimes it drifts away. October, it drifted away a little bit, right? Everybody probably drifted away from every goal because that was crazy. So um, this is what we look at. Now, if you were to be with us and, and hover over each one of these dots, that would actually show us 2.68% here, 2.21% here, 2.22% there. And we would know that the adjustment to make to get right back to that really center, oh, over here, center uh, dense spot to fit our goal, that would be the one to make. We then go make the adjustment, and then if it happens to be in a month where we update you guys, then we'll go to our customers and say, hey, the dividend fund, we had to make an adjustment. Now you see why. We don't just guess, right? So a lot of customers are like, don't know how you figure this out, Dustin, but I'm glad you do. That's why. So that, what you're looking at on the screen is essentially a portfolio-specific efficient allocation. Uh, and that's the biggest words I can use, really. That, that's all I have to offer. <laughs> so you know now how it works. If you have a group of stocks, and I'm, not, I'm all for the people that want to buy stocks and be engaged, but if you're investing for retirement on your own, find a way to see if you're investing as efficiently as possible. There may be something built into the offering that you have there, uh, or the platform that you use, but you need to make sure that you're not taking so much risk for a return that you are not even shooting for, right? If you want to shoot for above average returns or something greater than your current um, growth, you're going to have to take more risk. But if you're shooting, for, I wanted to show this one in particular because this one is conservative. If you're trying to be conservative by design, then take the least amount of risk possible, be as efficient as possible so that you know you're dialed in, right? Just like anything else in, in the world. I want you to think, I, I joke about this, I want you to think when it comes to investing like a millennial does when it comes to their parents. Millennials, not me, I hope not me. Yes, my mom, I guess. Uh, but you know how the kids are just kind of like, ugh, I don't want to do it, I'll ask mom. Ugh, I'm not doing that, mom will do it, dad will do it, whatever. That, you get some kids that do the least amount of work for, you know, for what little tiny return uh, they will get, you know, so it's sort of a joke, I guess. It's a horrible joke, but be lazy to the point of efficiency. Get it done, get in there, do your homework, figure out what you need to do. Make sure you're not playing over here in this land somewhere with investments that are way too risky for the return you're trying to generate and go from there, right? Then you know, not only that, think of what we did. We told you uh, on the Doe Show here, we've told you where to go to invest as far as the accounts to start with. We've told you now how to figure out your number or we'll figure out your number for you. And now we're telling you to be as efficient as possible. There's not much else I can cover. You now know that your money's going to the right account types. You now know that you have the right dollar amount going to each account type. And now you know the investments inside of it are as efficient as possible. If it's a 401k, 457, we may be limited because they only offer you so many investments. We'll make that as efficient as possible. Now, at the end of the day, you're on autopilot. You are not randomly guessing how much money to put into an account, which accounts most has the greatest tax advantage, how many dollars do I put in there, and what about these investments? Do they, are they, do they even make sense, right? So when you think of the confidence that you have when you know that that's happening. Anybody else say, oh, the market's tanking. You go, I'm in the right spot. I know the market's gonna go up and down. I get it, it happens, but I know I have the most efficient allocations in the accounts I'm supposed to at the time I'm supposed to with the right dollar amount, right? <laughs> Anyways, 
I really appreciate uh, you guys paying attention today because uh, I know like this chart, I don't do videos on this because nobody cares, right? What is that? It looks like someone just started throwing darts at a piece of paper. I get it. It's something that we like to geek out on here, but that's our job. So aren't you kind of thankful we do that? <laughs> But uh, it's something we don't talk about often, but it makes so much sense when I drew it out. And last night, basically, I was up all night because of the midterm elections, futures markets. I told you they'd be exciting. They were exciting, especially around 3 a.m., by the way, if you've got a chance to see what was going on there. I'll, maybe I'll show it later. Um, and I started drawing this out thinking that's how I'm going to explain it. So ideas, you know, they just come to me. <laughs> I uh, wish you guys had been around to gauge my allocations in your 457. A little tougher. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, a little tougher there because they, um, uh, you know, we're limited in our choices there. But, uh, you know, you do what you can with what's offered. And a lot of the uh, 401ks and 457s, they do a good job having at least, you know, 30 different invest. Take out the target date funds. You usually have a good choice of other things in there. And, uh, so, you know, it's something that you can kind of work with there. Anyways, if I've helped you or confused you or pissed you off, if you do me a favor and hit the subscribe button, that greatly helps us. I'm hoping next year to talk in front of a bunch of advisors in the business. We are gaining a little traction as far as getting attention there. Uh, but right now, when I ask these conferences, hey, can I come and speak? They go, who? What? what? <laughs> so if we can up the subscriber count, not only does that help us look bigger, but also the data is what I want to share. So all the views that you guys use, how long you spend watching certain topics, you know I'm all about the stats. I want to share that with advisors and let them know, go teach your customers. Teach them how things work and they'll be much happier. I don't, maybe that means they'll end up making videos and we'll, um, you know, have competition, but I didn't think of that part till just now. Doesn't matter. I still want to do it. Uh, I think it'd be really important for us. So if you'll hit the subscribe button, I would greatly appreciate it. I won't ask anything of you anymore. Uh, where does Forex trading fall on this scale? Well, that's trading. Uh, so what we're talking about today is building a portfolio that you would then hold. Uh, Forex trading is something completely separate where you're just actively buying and selling. And so, uh, Denry, your focus is on your win-loss ratio and your batting average. That's all you care about. When you buy and sell Forex positions, were you successful? And if so, by how much? Were you unsuccessful? If so, by how much? That's how you're gonna measure your success and just crank them out, man. Just as many times as you can place those trades. Good luck, by the way. I, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm very good at futures, very good at options. I'm decent with stocks when it comes to active trading, like minute by minute, uh, but I am horrible horrible. I will never be the YouTuber guy that's like, look at all the money I made on Forex. No, I'd be more than happy to do make YouTube videos on look at how much I cried because I lost all the money. Uh, I am horrible at Forex. Uh, futures, that's my game. That's, that's where I'm at. I, I, a little soft spot for that. Anyways, I'm going to wrap it up there before I get in trouble. I will uh, see you guys later for the closing beat. What a market today. We've got a lot to talk about as far as that goes. A lot of underlying things. So we'll be back at 5 o'clock Eastern time to talk about that. I appreciate you guys watching and bearing with me. We'll see you then. Why should you choose Jazz Wealth as your retirement or long-term investing service? Our portfolios are managed by us, not some faceless mutual fund manager. Our private classes will teach you everything about investing and getting your dough straight. Best of all, our fiduciary standard means your best interest comes before ours.